What's going on, YouTube? My name is Lucas, and today we have an absolute amazing special guest, Ryan Wall, CEO and co-founder of Valkyrie. So, Ryan, I appreciate you coming on. It's absolutely amazing to have you here uh, for two reasons. Obviously, um, because you're the CEO and co-founder of Valkyrie, but number two, uh, I did serve in the military, and to be interviewing you in what you were able to do um, is a privilege. So I just want to thank you for your service and thank you for that as well. I really, really appreciate that. Thank you so much for having me on and it's an honor to be interviewed by you. Yeah, thank you. Um, so that kind of leads me into my first question. How do you apply your experiences that you obtained as a soldier and as a ranger to being a CEO of a company? You know, it's, it's, I would say, especially what I had done, um, just being in a uh, ranger unit and having to, um, you know, really become very efficient at the individual level. Um, it's very similar to a startup, um, you know, b before missions, you would do PCI inspections, right? You'd make sure that all of your gear was right, all of your, your mags were loaded, and all of those little things are what you do for business, just... Mm -hmm checking your numbers, you're checking your charts, you're doing all the different things that, um, so while the tasks may be different, it's very similar skill sets. Um, I remember I, I did my first patrol in ranger school and I didn't have perfect accountability of all of my gear and it, it counted against me, right? I was the, the team leader and um, I had to go make sure the whole squad had all their gear done, right? And so, um, you know, all of those little tasks are what add up into, you know, running, running a company. So um, from a personal, individualized skill set point of view, it's very efficient. And then also from a strategic and planning point of view as to see where the market's going. Yeah. Yeah. That, I mean, that's one of the th biggest things I want to ask because, you know, most people don't have the opportunity to one, be in the military and especially get to the level you got to. So that was definitely one of the biggest questions I wanted to ask you. Um, that, which goes into my next one. Um, your guys' product is obviously for drone delivery, which I think is is absolutely going to be amazing for the future. And it's just as important as the drone itself, in my, my opinion. Um, and in September of 2019, you guys teamed up with T-Mobile to become the first smart mailbox. Can you speak about your mailbox and maybe go into a little bit of detail on that mailbox? Sure. So uh, as you mentioned, yes, last September, um, we, we had done a demonstration over Sprint's 5G network in, in Peachtree Corners, uh, Georgia, at their Curiosity Lab. Um, we were very excited to be working with them and, you know, being able to utilize the T-Mobile Sprint network is, is a great win for us um, as well as for them. Um, so we were really excited about that and it was really showing the, the first demonstrations of the technology coming together, you know, it was still a very crude demo and by no means the, the final result, but it really was the foundation for a lot of those systems. Um, we were testing the, the drone's ability to uh, uh, autonomously fly over the landing station, uh, locate the top of it. Um, we ended up not doing the full landing um, in, that, in that demonstration just for safety reasons. Um, but all of the communication that was happening between the drone and our landing station was occurring over 5G. Um, and so it really demonstrated a lot of that. And, and we really started building off of that. Um, we built our first mailbox prototype in 2017. Um, we tested it, we found a lot of issues that you know, we needed to fix. And so that second iteration is what we demonstrated for Sprint. Um, we're currently building the third iteration, which is going to be much, much more robust and significant and, and um, it's going to meet a lot of the challenges that we found in those first two iterations. Um, a lot of the lessons learned that we had were implemented into our drone delivery station, which is the, the seven and a half foot tall uh, locker system. Um, and so we're, we're figuring out a lot of the, the nuances in that system and then taking that over to the mailbox. So when we release that um, next year, it's, it's going to be a very dynamic system. I think it's gonna catch a lot of attention. That's awesome. I, I bet it's exciting to see the growth that, you know, from the very beginning, the prototype that starts out from the very beginning to the continuation of the growth of that box. I bet that's just, I mean, it's exciting. And, you know, 5G is something that we've, as a world, have been expecting and really been kind of excited for. And you guys are implementing that into your box. I think that's, that's absolutely amazing. Um, some of the things that you kind of hit on in that 
um, leads me to my next one. Um, in October, you guys had an announcement, um, which you made a, an agreement with Valkyrie, or excuse me, with Ag Eagle, um, and you agreed to a two-year contract. Could you talk about how this will be beneficial for your guys' company and what we can expect from that agreement with Ag Eagle? Sure. Um, you know, we love the team at Ag Eagle. They're a phenomenal group and we never cease to be impressed with, you know, what they're doing. Um, you know, they had the, um, they had the vision that we had. And so not only did it make sense to utilize their manufacturing um, and their growing, you know, footprint now that they moved to Wichita, um, you know, we see a lot of synergies with Ag Eagle. So um, we're very excited that they, are going to be manufacturing we believe they have all the expertise needed and we can count on them to you know meet our deadlines um and they they took an equity position in us so the fact that they had that faith in us you know really cemented it for us that they believe in the vision like we do and so um you know we're very excited about having increased distribution through them and increased presence you know they just got pulled into the the beyond program in kansas mm -hmm. and you know that, that's a huge win for them um we're very excited to be um you know supporting them for whatever they're going to be doing in that um but we see a lot of synergies with Ag Eagle outside of just those those um, core areas, so to speak, right? Uh, Michael has an extremely, um, I wouldn't even call it an aggressive vision. I would say it's a very realistic vision. Mm -hmm. You know, he wants to get these things done on a, a realistic timeline, but he's not he's not taking his foot off the gas, right? So yep. those are the kind of teams we like working with. And so as we start to develop these things, and I'm not sure if I can publicly talk about some of the things we're working on, but there should be some very exciting announcements. That's that's absolutely amazing to hear. And I'm sure a lot of people watching are definitely going to be excited about that. Um, kind of to reiterate a little bit on the Beyond program, are they going to be able to incorporate, because I know a lot of it's for Beyond the line of sight, are they going to be able to incorporate your guys' you know, box into that you know, whole entire system at all or you know, we're, we're kind of taking their lead on it. It's all, yep. you know, a very new situation. Um, we are ready if they do want to incorporate the landing stations to, to showcase for the FP, uh, FAA. Um, if for some reason they, you know, want to do the beeve loss and then bring us in at a later time, we're still happy to support them. So, um, you know, we're, we're in the beginning looks of that, but, um, you know, I can't speak one way or another yet. Yep. Completely understand. Um, and kind of continuing on. So, I, like I said, I think you guys, <clears throat> I, I truly do think you have a special product uh, for something that will be very, very important here in the near future, especially with the current pandemic we're going through. Um, can you guys get, or can you give a brief timeline on the expectations for like drone delivery and what should we be expecting to be delivered first really? And how will Valkyrie have a role in that? Sure. Um, what we're seeing is, is, very systemic approaches by all the regulators from the FAA, um, Transport Canada, and, and all the European agencies. Um, what's going to happen is you're going to see these iterations. And, you know, sometimes for guys like me inside the industry, it almost seems like an eternity. Yeah. Um, but at the same time, and it's going to happen, and it's going to seem like it happened overnight once it does. Um, you're going to see these pockets of, of growth, right? So yeah. like Kansas is growing, you know, Zing and, and Ag Eagle in, in Kansas and, um, you know, the 10 other sites the FAA has been working with. And so you're starting to see these little concentrated circles where, you know, you're going to have different packages being moved. Um, I would say right now, predominantly, it's, it's a lot of medical, a lot of high value items. Um, yeah. It justifies, you know, some of these initial costs, right? I mean, like anything coming into market, right? It, it's always going to be more expensive when it's first developed than 10 years into it. So um, the economics really make a lot of sense for medical deliveries. But as these systems are getting proofed out and we're, um, you know, making them better, cheaper, faster, you know, that's driving the cost down. So um, I would say that it opens up into a much greater market um, in the next 18 months. Um, we're going to hear a lot of good news uh coming out over the next 18 months and there's going to be a lot of big um announcements and, and exciting things happening across the industry and it's all starting to come together um what we've really seen was up through 2018 the main focus was on the drone right mm -hmm. all about drone hardware and everything else was was kind of too far ahead yeah. um 
2019 and 2020, we're seeing, you know, the FAA is doing uh, remote ID. Um, similar things are happening in, in Europe and Canada. And now that they've established that they've been able to contact the drone, it can keep um, in regulation with all the airspace requirements and everything else. Um, now the, the requirements are BVLOS, right? Now the FAA is saying we feel comfortable to this point. Now we want to get into BVLOS. So we really see 2021 and beyond being about the ecosystem integrating, right? The uh, infrastructure coming together, right? Having um, our landing stations, having recharging, having all these various things that are going to turn this into a full-blown logistics network as opposed to, you know, the toys and novelties of 10 years ago. Yeah. Um, it's, it's really going to um, kind of grow. These, these circles of use are going to grow and you'll start with maybe medical deliveries and then they might add in a few other different items. And before long, you'll have other ones popping up and these, these circles will start overlapping. And that's really when the network is starting to take shape. Um, I believe that we're going to start seeing drone deliveries to a number of people's um, homes in these various places over the yep. next 18 months. Um, and then realistically over the next uh, five years, I would say, is is the full timeline, right? Uh, you know, people always ask me why I think five years. I think drone deliveries will be happening over the next two years. I don't think it will be accessible for every single person to order any item from whether it be Uber Eats, Amazon, whomever, for about five years. I think it's going to take that long for the system to really um, come into itself. Um, but for right now, it, the, the technology proving and integrating these systems are the key factors that are going to make the next 18 months critical. Yeah. And I, you know, I think with, with your guys's vision and obviously there's other companies that have the vision and kind of the tracking it down. I think that there's a lot of people around that are in the very infant stages of just drones in general. And I think that as it starts to, those people start to catch up with what you guys are envisioning. I think it's like you said, it's just going to pop and take off. And, you know, then I was thinking too, as I'm doing videos, I'm thinking, I think of all kinds of things as I'm doing them. And I'm like, well, I could implement that. I can implement that. And it's like, once everything is in place, then people have to be put into those tasks and they have to be able to do those tasks. So those are all the things that I keep thinking about too, is like, once everything is established, then those people have to, to learn the programs and, and learn how to do those things. And so there's just, like you said, there's still you know, room for improvement, or I guess you could say, or growth, but I think it's definitely, definitely, definitely coming for sure. So that's I mean, absolutely, that's awesome. If you look at the economics of it, I mean, 115 years ago, if you were driving a car, you mm -hmm. could drive for two miles an hour and somebody was standing in front of you with a flag and a lantern to make sure you didn't run over pedestrians at two miles an hour. And now we have, you know, Bugatti supercars, yeah. right? The, the, the ability for technology to get into everyday life once it hits its stride is is remarkable yeah. and you know i see drones at that same stage right now right you got to have all of these things you know essentially you know you can't fly without the waiver beyond visual and all these other things it's it's the guy with the lantern and the flag right? yeah it's just that time they're they're getting it all figured out but before long it's going to be like it's been here nonstop. I mean, the smartphone, I always say it's 12 years old. Yeah. Think about how much the world has changed in the last 12 years from just the first iPhone. Yeah. Right. And all the things that it opened up from social media to all these other things, it it's, it's just at the beginning of what this is going to be. I wouldn't even say the tip of the tip of the iceberg has even been breached yet. So yeah. to your point, I mean, there's going to be massive jobs around the maintenance, the repair, the flight, the, everything that goes into these things. And I really think over the next decade, it's going to be one of the, you know, saving graces for a lot of the issues that have arisen already this year. Yeah. No, I, I agree 100%. That's why I think I'm more, when it comes to doing these YouTube videos, I'm, I'm starting to lean more towards you, your guys's type of, I guess, field. And the reason I do that is because I think it is so up and coming and it's going to provide such an, an epic service to so many people. I mean, I constantly talk about how many, you know, elderly people probably need medicines, you know, pharmaceuticals, and they can't get out to go get those. And a drone can easily just drop and deliver that off, off to them. And, and, you know, then I started thinking too, all the old folks' homes and neighborhoods and communities that could easily just have all that inf stuff just delivered. I mean, 
you're the endless opportunities are there and it's just like i think we're all just excited to see it happen you know what's even more exciting is now that you know the mail is starting to be revolutionized logistics is starting to be um revolutionized it's what's exciting for me is the underlying things that we can do with them. So for your point, right, elderly care facilities, if you have somebody who is getting in home or, or they're in some facility, the treatment is, is staggeringly expensive, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, in home treatment for an elderly person could be over $100,000 a year easy. And yeah. a lot of that time is not spent on care for that person. It's spent on the logistics of feeding them, getting them their medicine, the essential supplies. And so if we can provide automated delivery of those things, we no longer need to have the high costs of in-home care, right? You can have a nurse come by and check on the person and you don't need to have um, them getting food and coordinating all these other things. And what we see from that is, is one of the systems that, that we're working on for, for a use case like this in particular, um, let's say you have Gladys up in 3A and you deliver meals, medicines, and supplies to her a few times a day from a central location. Um, we know from tracking the data that Gladys always receives her packages and, and gets them out of the, the landing station within 10 minutes. Mm -hmm. And that would be 99% certain that that's just her behavior. If we send a, a delivery and she doesn't pick it up for 20 minutes, we now know there is an abnormal behavior. So we can trigger wellness checks. We can trigger somebody to go and check on her, make a yeah. call and say, hey, Gladys, are you okay? And hopefully if there is a situation, we can catch it where it wouldn't have been caught before. So, you know, really tracking how we can use this system, not only to get people their goods, but to improve their lives is what's the, yeah. the really exciting thing for me. Yeah. And like, I mean, even that right there, that just, that's exciting just for me to hear, because I know that it's just going to be evolution. I mean, evolutionary and re the revolution of this is going to be amazing. It really mm -hmm. is. So I'm excited. I'm excited to see everything that continues to, to grow from all this. It's just going to be amazing. Um, and all that kind of does lead me into my next question. It um, basically with more and more companies um, starting the approval process from the FAA, can you kind of talk about, um, you know, what that process kind of entails? I know, you know, you have to fly up to like 400 hours and things like that, but is there maybe some other things that are required that people don't really know about? Well, I mean, let's put it this way, you know, look at the companies that have gotten 135, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, they're not small operations, no. you know, it's uh, essentially a 30 to 40 man team, uh, two years straight, nonstop to get approval. Yeah. Right. Yep. I mean, it is um, an expensive proposition, and that's why it's kind of been relegated to the giants, right? That's not a bad thing because they're figuring out this process while it's very costly. And then once the FAA has type certification in place, it's, it's much easier because now you have the template to go through. So um, they're really paving the way in a lot of ways for you know, other companies to enter into this. Um, you know, it seems like the regulations are constantly getting improved and, um, you know, gearing towards uh, a full drone network. So, um, you know, there, there's some nuances and it depends on the size of your drone. And, you know, like you said, experience. And, you know, if you have, you know, 400 hours and you've got a few crashes in there, that's a different 400 hours than a 400 clean flight hours, right? Yeah, so, yeah. Um, you know, those types of things kind of make it a little bit more of a complicated formula. Um, you know, if you're flying over people, if you're adding these risk matrices in there, um, it, it becomes a, a little bit more of a daunting process. And, you know, as Valkyrie, that's why we don't focus on drones. Um, you know, we want to be extremely solid in building landing stations for every customer, whether it's a mailbox, whether it's a drone delivery station or a window unit, it, we want to provide that seamless interface between the customer and the drone. And there is more than enough that needs to go into the thought of that and the design of that. Oh, yeah. um, you know, adding drone flights to us would put us probably beyond what our capabilities are. So instead we have this universal application and now we can partner with the best in class, right? So yep. Ag Eagle and, and many of our other phenomenal partners across the world, you know, they're, they're working on those individual use cases. They're working in those individual geographies and servicing those markets, right? And yep. 
right now there is no best answer. Everybody's still figuring out what works the best, right? So, um, you know, we're taking the approach that we just want to support the industry as a whole. Yeah. Right? Mailbox now does not care if it's a UPS package, a USPS package, or an Amazon package. You don't have a different mailbox for each of them. Mm -hmm. right? You need to have this neutral third-party mailbox that doesn't determine, right? You don't want Amazon saying, oh, you can't get a package from UPS, right? Yeah. You want to have something that is, you know, able to take traditional deliveries as well as drone deliveries, right? Whether it's medicine, meals, mail packages, right? So we designed that our system, so the drone companies don't have to, they just yep. got to focus on flying, keeping that drone safe, keeping the people safe and getting the contents from A to B and we'll take care of everything in between. Yeah. Yeah. That, I mean, that, that's absolutely amazing to hear. It, it truly is. And I think that, you know, with, with all that stuff that is continuing to evolve with that is just, it's, it's extraordinary. And so that kind of, that leads me to a little bit more of another question with that, as, as far as like, with the FAA really kind of being strict in the United States is, do you find it Europe's less, I guess, less strict and it's easier to, 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 uh, I guess I get approvals and fly and do all that things over there. N not necessarily, but that's changing. Um, you know, right now there's some differentiation country to country on, you know, little things that are allowed. Um, there was recently a map published and it kind of showed that it's such a patchwork and it's, it's, there's not one thing that works. And so what we're seeing is none of these countries necessarily have the right answer. And so yeah. they're all kind of working in lockstep, right? One might be six months ahead now and they might be six months behind later, but they're all working towards the same thing. And, um, you know, our partners over at DroneSec in Australia, I was having a conversation with uh, Mike a couple of weeks ago and you know this got brought up then and you know he said look it's the FAA it's it's Transport Canada it's the European Union right when was the last time they had a major crash in their airspace right when was the last time you had a loss of life from a major crash yeah right so for us selfishly we would want this to move a little faster but in my opinion that would be almost um, counterproductive because if we rush these things and somebody gets hurt or yeah. you know not airworthy enough it ends up setting us back right look what happened with autonomous vehicles when they hit a person not even to the fault of the vehicle but it still set the industry back about a year yeah. right yeah and so we don't want to have those same things so while the faa it seems strict now um for me it's it's a necessary strictness it's part of the crawl walk run that they're trying to achieve and all of that is built so we're, we can do this safely and we can do this continuously and there's not these major hang-ups from you know disasters um you know europe is going to be uh implementing the, what they had passed last year and and so january 1st there will be a much more blanketed European uh, airspace criteria for drones. It's not going to be country specific anymore, mm -hmm. um, which is going to really help the industry. Um, but even then, I mean, we're seeing, you know, the, the FAA, now that they're doing beyond and all these other things, they're really advancing these to the next steps, right? Our partners up in Canada, Indro Robotics, you know, they just got approved for BBWAS, right? Mm -hmm. Um, you know, we have partners in, in other parts of the world that have the only BVOS license in their country, right? Yep. And so for us, it's it's more about um, being good stewards of the industry and, and doing our part well, so we're not a weak point in the chain. And, you know, once this next 18 months kind of comes together and we see all of these technologies building one robust system and demonstrating that to the FAA, that's going to be the inflection point. That's when everything explodes. Yeah. And, and I think to hit on that all too, is I think what is very unique about you guys is you can, like you said too, numerous times, you're supporting everything that's going on. So when the drone was solely focused on and there, all these <clears throat> big companies are going through that process, they may not nece necessarily have to worry about what it's going to land on. Right. You guys are able to supply that. So you don't have to worry about, you know, how the drone is functioning necessarily, but you, you can, supply that product to that company and say, Hey, look, we, we know our product's good here. You're good to go. And they can focus on that FAA approval or whatever else they need to get approvals on. I think that's awesome. And, you know, I, I'm glad the FAA is kind of strict. I think, I, I think it's going to make more people feel comfortable. I think once 
you know, because they are so strict, more people are going to be like, okay, I can understand this. There's less likely to have accidents. There's less likely things are going to happen and occur from this. So when they do see drones flying through the air and delivering packages, they're going to be more comfortable and acceptable that, and then they may be more likely to order and, and do it that way as well. So those are things I was kind of thinking of from that. Um, but Absolutely. yeah, um, my, you kind of hit on it a little bit. Um, I'm going to, I'm going to ask this one anyways. Um, obviously with the pandemic we're currently in and it's still having a major impact on the economy and more and more people are starting to order products online as we saw with Black Friday and we saw with Cyber Monday. Um, and then people are, you know, more likely to do food deliveries through Uber Eats and Postmates and Grubhub and all that. Have you seen more of a, a pressure, I guess you could say, on starting to get deliveries completed by drone? And yes. okay. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I would say that our demand increased uh, probably at least 10x from COVID and our timelines got accelerated in some cases, you know, three, four hundred percent. Um, you know, it seems like what was there wasn't a real hurry towards drone delivery right i mean there was steps being taken but there wasn't this you know existential need like there is now right yeah. i mean we're leaving your house might be a life or death situation if we can provide contactless delivery to every single person that needs it right uh, not only that, but building that in with healthcare, right? We've seen, uh, you know, tremendous growth in the, the healthcare delivery market more than anything. And, you know, when you start looking at our landing stations being implemented now in, in collaboration with telehealth, you can have a patient go do a telehealth appointment with their doctor, say, I have symptoms. The doctor says, great, we'll send you a test, right? They'll, they'll send it by drone. It'll be in your landing station or your mailbox. You go there, you get it, you swab your mouth, put it back in. The drone picks it up, takes it right to the lab. If it tests positive, now we can schedule meals and medicine coming to you for the next 14 days. You never have to leave your house. Um, so that would be the ultimate goal is, you know, whatever you need, it, yep. it will be able to be delivered by drone and, and COVID accelerated that. And, you know, it's one of the few silver linings of COVID, I would say. Yeah. Well, and that, yeah. And I think that that's kind of been unique too, is because you're starting to see a lot of, I guess, sectors like fitness as well, you know, and just use the example Peloton, you know, Peloton was kind of doing its thing and then the pandemic hit and it's like, holy smokes, like this is, have done wonders for the likes of a Peloton. And mm -hmm. I think it's, going to start doing more and more for sectors obviously like we know what amazon is all about but it only assisted them even further and i think that that's going to you know help catapult drone deliveries and all that as well um so in a way it i mean obviously it's a it's a terrible terrible thing but i think there we can draw some positives from the pandemic as well so i, I would agree with that you know i mean we were we were very nervous in the beginning um you know we had some investors that got wiped out in that early market crash and some money we were counting on didn't come in. You know, several members of our team have contracted COVID over the last nine months, um, you know, and so it's, it's definitely had its challenges, you know, but overall for the industry, it's, it's done tremendous. Yeah. And I think it just shows too how as a world where we can evolve with things like this. I mean, it's amazing to just see, like I said before, the evolution of just, you know, kind of getting hit taking it and then just learning from it and growing from it and then I guess basically creating new things around it and it's just it's amazing to see um my final question is more for fun so um you know when when obviously the current circumstances we're in it's kind of hard but what are your hobbies like what do you like to do outside of you know Valkyrie and what you know what what do you like to do you know um I would honestly say most of my my fun activities have taken a back seat, especially <laughs> in a couple of years. You know, Valkyrie's really taken over. Um, but you know, I, I enjoy a lot of creative activities. Um, I like to play the piano. I taught myself how to play the piano after I got out of the military. Um, they said it would help with my my concentration and my stress levels. Um, I like to paint. Um, yeah. you know, I, COVID uh, definitely gave me a borderline problematic sneaker habit so <laughs> i'm buying way too many of those while i've been uh locked down um but 
you know I genuinely like to explore new things I mean anything novel you know I like to I don't want to do the same thing I don't want to see the same things I don't want to be necessarily around the same people all the time right? yeah I want to go out and explore the world and that's really what gives you a lot of insight and perspective and yeah. um, you know it's really been important for me between you know military and schooling and my other companies and, and now Valkyrie it's given me a perspective I believe is is unique i don't think that there's very many people that have you know walked in the same shoes i have and so i think that's partly why alex and i were able to kind of tackle this early on is you know we just have a very different way of seeing the world yeah yeah i i like i said before too like i can't i can't thank you enough ryan it's a privilege to have you on here for multiple reasons um it truly is amazing uh just i want you to know you are my first interview and uh it's been a complete blast. It truly has. Um, and like I said, I can't thank you enough. This is amazing. So, uh, yeah, I feel the same way. I really appreciate you having me on, and I hope we can uh, do this again when we have some updates to share. And us and Ag Eagle and some of the other people have made some exciting announcements, and we can talk about it here. For sure, that sounds amazing. Let's do it. Uh, well, Ryan Walsh, co-founder C um, and CEO, current CEO of Valkyrie. I appreciate it, Ryan. I really do. This, this was amazing. Um, yeah. I do look forward to it, uh, doing it again. So. Yeah, this has been awesome. Uh, like I said, I watch your videos. I think you've got an awesome perspective on things and you definitely are seeing trends that, you know, a lot of other people aren't. So, um, yeah, kudos to you for all that. Thank you.